All right. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Ming Lang. So I'm today's host of our uh, crunch seminar. So uh, we're glad we're very glad today uh, that we will have two talks today. Right. So the first talk will be given by Professor uh, Samnas Ghosh and his student, uh, George M. Shravan and Xiaofan. Uh, so, so Professor Samnas Ghosh is the Michael Collis Professor in the Department of Civil Engineering and a Professor of uh, ME and Material Science Engineering at Johns Hopkins. So he is a funding director of um, uh, JS JHU Center of Integrated Structure Materials Modeling and Simulation and was the director and PI of, of the Air Force Center of Excellence in Integrated Material Modeling. His research focuses on multi-scale structure material analysis and simulation, multi-physics modeling and simulation of multifunctional material, among many other interesting fields. He has conducted pioneering research to advance the field of integrated computational structure material modeling into new areas of importance and challenges. So um, Professor Ghosh um, will give us a talk today with uh, title Physics Embedded Machine Learning Methods in Hierarchical Constitutive damage modeling of metal and uh, composites. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming our first speaker. Thank you very much, Ming Lan. You know, that was a very kind introduction. Uh, I'd also like to thank Professor George Karniadakis, my friend for a, for a long time, uh, for his invitation uh, to this platform. It's, it's a pleasure. And I'm going to give uh, this talk together with my postdocs, Shravan Kotha. Shravan, you can raise your hand, yeah. Uh, then my graduate student, almost completed now, uh, Shafan Zhang, uh, <coughs> Shafan, raise your hand. And uh, my other postdoc, George Weber, uh, who uh, will shortly uh, be leaving the group. Um, uh, so uh, I, I will, I'll, I'll do this presentation together with uh, them um, uh, who have really contributed to this area. Uh, first of all, let me confirm that we have a total of about one hour, right? For this talk? Yes, yes, approximately, yeah. Okay, okay, good, thank you. Okay, so the basic idea behind this is so we are, we've been working in the field of multi-scale modeling, which is coupling structural performance with materials behavior. And you can see these are two examples and we are actually working quite heavily in both of these areas. This is actually uh, multi-scale modeling. The one you see here corresponds to multi-scale modeling of uh, metals, which are used uh, quite a bit in engine, uh, aircraft engine components. And this is one of the areas that uh, you know uh, we are doing quite a bit. We are working with the OEMs uh, uh, on this, and you can see various scales. This lowest scale corresponds to the atomistic scales. Then the scales of discrete dislocations in nickel-based superalloys. You have gamma gamma prime uh, phases in the microstructure from where we go into the polycrystalline phase, and then we go all the way up to the scale of the component. For composites, again, similar, you know, we have these uh, molecular dynamic scales uh, of uh, explicit atoms. You can go into these coarse grains, coarse graining, and then that uh, can be upscaled into these uh, RVEs, so-called representative volume elements, which are uh, manifesting uh, fibers, uh, matrices, and, and various architectures. And that then contributes to the overall uh, structural component. So these correspond to different spatial as well as temporal scales. And we've been working a lot in these fields and made some significant contributions. So when we talk about multi-scale structural materials modeling, you know, you, as I just said, you go all the way from the molecular dynamics and what you're seeing here is a cracked tip from which you have uh, dislocations emanating, and that can be put in this crystal plasticity-based model with phase field. This is a fracture with phase field models, and the, the, some of those phase field models are actually now being fed from the uh, MD simulation-based 
uh, mechanics here, and then we actually upscale all of this into structural scale performance. So when we go into extreme properties, extreme behavior, these things, uh, you know, the multi-scaling becomes challenging as well as necessary. So for example, failure related properties like damage, toughness, ductility, fatigue, we are especially interested in uh, fatigue, uh, damage, ductility and fatigue. They involve multi-scale phenomena inherently. Uh, mo modeling the entire structure at the mi microscopic scales is exhaustive, sometimes uh, intractable. So we need the concepts of RVEs. Uh, Structural scale simulations using phenomenological constitutive models lack information on microstructural variables and mechanisms. So we do need these physics-based multi-scale models in the spatial and temporal domains to provide resolutions for localized mechanisms with high efficiency. And then eventually all of this leads to structural location-specific materials design. Uh, which is ultimately the objective of all the OEMs. So hierarchical upscaling and multi-scale modeling using homogenization from uh, micromechanical uh, simulations has been around for a long time. Okay, and you can see variational frameworks, self-consistent models, FE square models, higher order homogenization, reduced order models, distribution enhanced homogenization frameworks. These have been proposed by various uh, authors and researchers. However, one thing is that many of these models are not very suitable for representing, representing complex material behavior, such as anisotropy, path-dependent material uh, behavior, tension, compression, asymmetries, and so on. And many of them are computationally prohibitive for large-scale structural simulations. So to, to overcome these problems, these issues, our group has proposed this class of, so in, to integrate multiple scales. So our group has pr proposed this parametrically homogenized constitutive models, which are also called PHCMs for metals and alloys, parametrically homogenized constitutive continuum damage mechanics models for composites. And also, uh, we in in the in the scope of multi-scale modeling, we are doing data-driven multi-scale models of fatigue nucleation, and uh, one example is, will be given here for nickel-based superalloys. So, what are these parametrically homogenized constitutive models? So, you can see this one is the PHCM, and we are showing a canonical form of the constitutive relation in these PHCMs. You know, you can see that. This actually is represented by this, uh, this variable, which we are calling PMS. This is a set that consists of important microstructural descriptors explicitly in the expressions for higher scale constitutive models. Okay, so they are functions not only of the state variables at the higher scales, but also explicit functions of the microstructural morphology, crystallography, what have you. So to do that, we first need a calibrated micromechanical model and we create a data set from this. Then we create win windows within these constitutive laws and within these sort of windows of coefficients, then we use machine learning to, to incorporate functional forms of the lower scale descriptors. And then once that is done, this can be used rather efficiently uh, in simulations of higher scale uh, components. So basically the idea here is we have thermodynamically consistent higher scale constitutive models with parametric delineation of lower scale morphology, crystallography, Oops, sorry. The first law of thermodynamics governing the mathematical theory of homogenization through energy equivalence uh, uh, bridges length scales. The second law of thermodynamics provides the general forms of the equations representing evolution of state variables in the PHCM. 
And then constitutive parameters and their evolution is expressed in terms of statistical distribution functions of microstructural descriptors. And this is where machine learning uh, becomes extremely important for deriving functional forms of these constitutive coefficients. So to provide it some schematic, we create a lower scale database, normally from analysis. It could be MD analysis. It could be analysis at the micromechanics level. Ramps are representative aggregated microstructural parameters. We are going to use this quite a bit. Ramps is very important representation of microstructural descriptors in these constitutive models. Together with homogenized micromechanical response, we use this in machine learning tools for higher scale constitutive coefficients, which are explicit functions of RAMs. What are the advantages? Advantages are that these models are easily incorporated in commercial codes, so people can use it rather easily through UMATS and equivalent uh, modules, significant efficiency without loss of accuracy from physics-based models, and direct connection of constitutive response to the microstructure. So this explicitly facilitates location-specific material design. Okay, so with that, I'm now going to turn this to Dr. Shravan Kotha, who is a postdoc, and he's going to be talking about PHCMs for metals and alloys. Shravan, can you, yeah. do you have control? Somnath, maybe a question. Has it has it been yet that people have found um, uh, how to say not only different formulas but different uh, variables or different parameters than the traditional ones? I oh don't know yes. If, yeah. No, can, no, absolutely. Can you give us a nice example, maybe just for fun? <laughs> See the the constitutive relations here. Okay, so. <coughs> from the second law of thermodynamics for a given performance, you know, the, the simple example is people use J2 plasticity. J2 plasticity does not have anisotropy generally, no tension compression asymmetry, and specifically no microstructural descriptors in their representation. So we have shown clearly that when it comes to, let's say, uh, you know, showing uh, performance, especially localization and maybe, you know, like fatigue crack nucleation, you know, these additional representations in the constitutive laws makes a huge difference. What we are predicting at the higher scales. Okay. Yeah. But so I, I, I certainly would, 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 even without really appreciating, I understand that. I, but I mean, if, how to exactly say if 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 there was some sort of uh, continuum mechanics uh, wonderful friend of yours that knew that the that the J2 was not good enough, would they have done qualitatively the same ad additional but, terms? But, but, but very he, very different. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So the, the the major difference will come. So for every time somebody has to do. Uh, higher scale constitutive model for a different, let's say in the microstructure, we change the microstructure. Okay, for example, let's say we change the distributions of the grain size, change the distribution of the crystallographic orientations, all of that. You know, when my friend who is doing this model, he or she has to recalibrate the whole thing, maybe with experiments, maybe with other things. In our model, you know, because those are explicit variables, in the constitutive form, all you have to do is, you know, once you, you can characterize the microstructure, they, you can directly incorporate them in the, in the micro, in, in the constitutive law itself. Okay, so the, 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 the descriptors uh, may have been the same, but the formulas, the actual closures would have been, or will be new or different. Or I didn't, but I should let the the, 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 the speaker speak. Thank you. Fine. Yeah, I yeah. appreciate okay. it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So uh, in this project, uh, mainly what we are trying to do is to establish this microstructure property relations um, for titanium alloys. On the left hand side, you can see that this is a titanium alloy microstructure, uh, which we basically simulate using high fidelity 
finite element simulations at the micro scale. Uh, but these simulations are expensive and the size of the domain that you can simulate is very small of the order of a couple of millimeters. Uh, so instead of that, what we propose is uh, uh, this microscopic homogenized constitutive models, which are called PHCMs, which are shown on the right hand side. Um, and a canonical form for the stress is given here, as Professor Kosh has mentioned, uh, where, for example, the stress is given explicitly as a function of these microscopic variables uh, and some microstructure dependent constitutive coefficients, which are represented here uh, with Y. So the goal here is uh, basically to calibrate and express these constitutive coefficients explicitly in terms of some microstructural descriptors. Okay. So for that, what we do is first, um, we characterize and also parameterize different microstructures using these ramps. Uh, these ramps can uh, basically describe, for example, the orientation distribution of the microstructure or misorientation distribution and also grain size and, and other, other important distributions. At the same time, the, the constitutive coefficients that you are seeing in higher scale models, these can correspond to, for example, elastic stiffness, which is given by the slope of this curve, or the initial yield stress. Um, or it could also be the hardening, uh, which is given by the slope of this curve here. So what we are trying to do is we are trying to use uh, machine learning tools uh, to establish these explicit dependencies uh, for these constitutive coefficients in terms of uh, these underlying ramps. So I'm going to show um, this with an example uh, in the coming slides. Uh, but let me first talk about uh, the microstructural parameterization and the ramps that we are using and how we are generating the data that we are going to use eventually with machine learning to obtain the functional forms. So this is a typical microstructure um, which has which can be characterized using different distributions that are given here. Uh, and these distributions can be represented using uh, different parameters. For example, these parameters are given here. So these can be scalars, vectors, or tensors that represent different uh, distributions of the microstructure. And then we, we sample the space of ramps uh, to create different microstructures. Uh, for example, here we have generated 150 different microstructures that span the space of these ramps that have different orientations and grain size distributions and other distributions. Uh, but as you know that the space of this uh, RAMS is very large, so we have selectively sampled the microstructure so that they can be as realistic as possible. Uh, and on these microstructures, we have performed about 500, uh, 5,000 CPFE simulations. This is a micromechanical model. And each of these simulations requires about three hours with 24 processors. So this entire data set generation requires about 350,000 CPU hours. So these are expensive simulations. Uh, and then once we have the data set, uh, the next step is to get the equations at the continuum scale. So these are thermodynamically consistent elastoplastic constitutive equations that we use in PHCM. For example, here you can see that uh, this is the equation for uh, elasticity. Uh, and we also have a set of constitutive equations uh, for plasticity where we have internal variables uh, with highly nonlinear evolution equations that are given here. Uh, so we choose these constitutive equations so that they satisfy the second law of thermodynamics, which is a requirement for every constitutive law. Um, and without directly using machine learning um, to, to basically like um, predict the stress from the micromechanical data, which is, which is almost impossible in this case, because these are highly nonlinear equations with uh, path and history dependence. So we either require a large amount of uh, we basically require a large amount of data to uh, predict the constitutive response. So instead, what we do is uh, we basically uh, get or learn the functional forms for these constitutive coefficients in the model. For example, this is a stiffness tensor. And then there is another tensor that characterizes the anisotropy in yield stress uh, and other variables. So we selectively use the machine learning uh, to learn the functional forms for these coefficients in terms of the microstructural variables. So uh, from the previous slide, so this is the set of microstructure dependent parameters that we have in the PHCM. And all these needs to be calibrated for each and every microstructure. And then their functional forms need to be learned from the data. 
So for each and every microstructure, um, we basically calibrate these constitutive coefficients uh, by solving a series of optimization problems uh, by matching, for example, the stress from the micromechanical model and the stress from the PHCM. So at the end of this optimization, uh, what we get is we get the data set where our inputs are the, the ramps and the outputs are uh, this set of constitutive coefficients for, for all the microstructures. And then using that data set, we can define a supervised uh, learning. Raman, can, I, can I ask a question here? Oh, yeah. I, I'm sorry, maybe I, you're already addressing my question. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so this is where we define the learning problem, where uh, basically given the data set that we have, um, we are trying to obtain the dependency of these constitutive coefficients. Each of these y belongs to this set uh, as a function of the ramps, which are given by this set here. So uh, for, for this project, we are uh, we wanted to get explicit functional forms instead of using neural networks. So, so we used uh, symbolic regression uh, based learning to explicitly get these functional forms. Could I ask something? Maybe this is what George Yorgos would have asked. So we, we have with Yorgos a good friend, uh, Anthony Barris, who works on constitutive equations for non-Newtonian fluid mechanics. And he just keeps telling us every time how it is important to look at the thermodynamic consistency of the functional forms that somebody puts in. Is, is this something you will t t t tell us about? I mean, does one have, a, a, would any such functional thing would be acceptable thermodynamically or not, or it doesn't matter, or, or later on? Do, is this something that you, you would yeah, discuss? So the, yeah, that... Go ahead. So. Yeah, so if, if we look at these constitutive equations, uh, the a priori satisfy the thermodynamic constraints. Okay, great. That's uh, so there, there are two things here. Uh, go, go to the other one. Uh, uh, so, so there are two things. One is, so the overall framework is satisfying, the framework of the constitutive law is automatically satisfying okay. the law of thermodynamics. Thanks. Now, the difference you asked me between others all these coefficients that he has marked with the blue, you know, these are actually being set up to satisfy the first law of thermodynamics. That means the energy equivalence from the lower scale to the higher scale. And this is completely missing in the context of any other constitutive law, okay? So, so what we are providing is the overall framework satisfies second law, the specific coefficients they are actually satisfying first law, okay? This is how the thermodynamic consistency is being established here. Thank you. All right, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. so I'll, I'll just like very briefly go through uh, symbolic regression using genetic programming uh, to get these functional forms. Uh, so here uh, we, uh, for to start the symbolic regression, we need to select a set of basis functions. Uh, for example, these could be polynomials, or exponential, or trigonometric functions, or logarithmic functions. And also we need to use, uh, select the set of mathematical operations you want the symbolic regression algorithm to use and manipulate these functional forms uh, eventually to get an optimized functional form. So these are these could be arithmetic operators or any other mathematical operators. Uh, once we choose these basis functions, then we can generate a random population. Uh, we have the RAM, so we can we can randomly generate different functional forms using these basis functions as well as the mathematical operators. And those functional forms can be represented using uh, these tree structures. For example, a simple um, x squared minus x is given here, which is represented using this tree. Uh, but the important step is the second step where we need to basically out of these random randomly chosen functional forms, we need to generate new forms that are better than the old forms and eventually obtain an optimal functional form. So for that, we use genetic algorithms where we choose a random uh, subset of forms and then we use the genetic operations such as this could be mutations that randomly change your input parameters, a crossover which basically acts on these tree branches and randomly changes them with uh, other functional forms and elitism. Uh, to basically obtain better functional forms in each generation than the previous generation. So this process is repeated for many generations. Um, and eventually we stop the, uh, we stop the regression until uh, we reach a specified number of generations or a stopping criterion is met, which is related to our fitness function. 
Uh, and at the end, what we have is the, the algorithm gives us a set of uh, functional forms and from which, uh, and based on the accuracy and complexity, we can choose uh, a desired functional form. So there are like a few advantages this method has. Uh, we can enforce some constraints on your inputs using a penalty method. Uh, and this method also gives explicit functional forms because we have chosen these basis functions. And so we can try to give interpretation for the functional forms that we are getting. Uh, and this is also known to give good results. Uh, that means simple and accurate forms uh, if your input uh, data space is low dimensional. So uh, I show this uh, algorithm with an example uh, for our constitutive model where we are trying to calibrate the functional forms for uh, a tensor, a fourth order tensor L. Uh, this basically gives the anisotropy in the yield stresses in different directions for, for a microstructure. Uh, so based on me uh, mechanics, uh, we actually have a few constraints that we need to satisfy. For example, we cannot independently give the functional forms for uh, these three alphas here, because if we give, then once we change the coordinate system, then uh, the forms that we get may not give us the correct results. Uh, so for that, what we do is we basically combine the data corresponding to all these coefficients, the alphas, gammas, and betas, and then give a single functional forms, a single functional form, uh, which maintains the invariance with respect to the change in coordinate system. Uh, so that's the constraint that we impose on our data. And then uh, while starting the algorithm, uh, these are the input ramps that we have given to the uh, algorithm and then we have chosen real constants and polynomials and these arithmetic operators uh, to be used in the symbolic regression and this is our fitness function where we are trying to calibrate not just the coefficients but the entire functional form as a function of these microstructural parameters uh, so for the anisotropic coefficient the two sets of anisotropic coefficients so these are the functional forms that we got using these operators that are given here uh, as you can see that uh, they are quite accurate. Their R square value is close to one. Uh, but uh, at the end, uh, we can look at these functional forms and give and relate uh, what these different terms in the functional form mean uh, to some mechanics-based explanations. For example, this is a the OMA is a parameter that accounts for the effect of orientation on overall anisotropy in yield stress. Uh, and if we if you look at the these multiplicative terms involving the OMAs and the size parameters, uh, these actually, uh, these interaction terms account for the direction dependent size effect that we have seen in titanium alloys. So with these simple forms, we can give sort of uh, physical explanation uh, in terms of the underlying mechanisms for, for these titanium alloys. And just to show- uh, uh, Hi, that, Shravan. Uh, yeah. Sorry, I have a question. Yeah. yeah, regarding this slide, uh, do the numbers shown here dimensionless or with some dimension? Yeah, th these are actually dimensionless. These are LBTized tilde, so it's these are non-dimensionalized. Okay, I see. Yeah. yeah, thank you. So this is a scatter plot showing the accuracy of the coefficients that got be from our micromechanical model versus uh, the coefficients obtained from the functional form. As you can see, uh, for our for almost all the microstructures, we get a pretty good accuracy with error of the order of 3%. Um, and we followed this procedure to get the functional forms for all the coefficients in our PHCM. And this is just a, a final experimental validation for the, for the model. This is at a microscopic level where we have simulated this tensile test specimen. Um, and this is a completely different microstructure. This is an experimental microstructure, which was not uh, there in our calibration data set or the training data set. As you can see that uh, PHCM uh, predicts the stress strain response uh, accurately for, for different strain rates. Uh, the advantage that Professor Ghosh mentioned can be quantified here for, for, for these kind of problems. Uh, if you look at a small domain, uh, which, is of the which has the dimensions of 25 micrometers, uh, the crystal plasticity micromechanical model takes about three hours and 24 processors. But the same simulation uh, using PHCM, uh, we, can, we can do it in three seconds on, on a single core. But when it comes to these microscopic specimens or structural components such as engine blades, we have almost billions and trillions of grains. So we won't be able to use crystal plasticity. But using PHCM, we can run these simulations uh, in 20 minutes on two cores. 
So this is just an example that shows the accuracy and efficiency of the PHCM that we have, uh, PHCM model that we have developed um, with uh, machine learning based functional forms. Um, all that's right. all I have for this part. Yeah. yeah. Thank you very much, Shravan. So let's move to the next part of the talk. We need to hurry up a little bit. Okay, uh, Shaofan Zhang, uh, uh, can you move? Let me move this. Okay, uh, who is going to talk about uh, the development of these PHC DMs uh, for uh, composite materials? Shaofan, take it over. I hope can show our uh, screen. <clears throat> You have control. I have. Hi everyone. Uh, I'm going to talk about how we uh, apply machine learning in the development of this parametrically homogenized continuum damage mechanics or PHDD model for composites. And so, as we know, uh, the damage in composites exhibit a multi scale phenomenon. Therefore, we develop, develop this uh, PHDD model. Uh, to integrate the uh, microscopic damage response into the microscopic uh, material constitutive loss. And because we have developed this model entirely based on these uh, micromechanical uh, responses, and we explicitly incorporate this lower level descriptors, such as the uh, microstructure descriptors and uh, the evolving material damage state into this constitutive law. The, this that makes this uh, constitutive model uh, microstructure sensitive, and it is uh, computationally efficient without the loss of accuracy. Therefore, uh, it is very suitable for uh, structural analysis and the material design. And during this process, uh, we need to use uh, machine learning to find appropriate functional representations of this uh, constitutive parameters in terms of this lower scale uh, descriptors. And especially, we want to incorporate this microstructure descriptors that represents the uh, microstructure morphology, such as fiber volume fraction, the spatial distributions, and so on. And we represent this as uh, representative uh, aggregated microstructure parameters, ramps. So the first step is to identify these ramps. Uh, Therefore, we create this microstructure database consists of uh, 600 microstructures with uh, unit direction from unit directional composites. They are of different fiber volume fraction and spatial distributions. And we uh, employ two point correlation functions to characterize the fiber spatial distribution in these microstructures. Uh, the two-point correlation function is, uh, represents the probability that two random points, x1 and x2, uh, fall into the same phase in the max domain. And we can calculate it uh, using this uh, ensemble average over this uh, max factor domain. Uh, as you can see from uh, this counter plot of the two-point correlation function, it is highly nonlinear and it contains many data points, it is hard to be parameterized. Therefore, it cannot be directly used as the ramps for our PHCM, because that's the input. Therefore, we need to find some lower order representation of this two-point correlation function. And uh, here we use uh, this principal component analysis uh, to get this re um, reduced order representation of the S2. So on the left, this one is the same uh, as two uh, in X-ray plane, shown in the previous slide. And we can identify these principal components using PCA uh, for uh, using the microstructure database. And we calculate S2 for all of them. And then we can perform PCA to get these principal components. With this representation, for each microstructure in the database, we can first calculate it its S2 and then represent it using this uh, representation. And then we can identify this uh, highlighted bait parameters in terms of uh, this principal components. And then we find out that um, for all microstructures uh, with about 30 uh, principal components, it is this reduced order representation, it is 
uh, is very accurate. Therefore, um, we use the we use these 30 beta parameters along with the fiber volume fraction of the microstructures as our ramps for this kind of microstructure. And in the, this slide, uh, it is just showing um, how we are generating the microstructure response database for calibrating the PHCM models. So we use this micro mechanical models like this as our data generation tool. Uh, it has, as, as I said, it has uh, 600 different realizations. And we, after performing this macromechanical FBM simulation, we uh, calculate the homogenized macromechanical responses, the stress and the strain, uh, using this uh, homogenization equations. And then subsequently, we can um, obtain uh, this overall second order damage tensor to represent this overall uh, and isotropic damage evolution in this microstructure. And this data will enter into this uh, MRDB database for our calibration. And our developed PSM model will be uh, able to predict this damage uh, evolution. So Shao Fan, I have a question. So this is, you have 30, you said the, the betas are 30, so that means 30 dimensions, right? Right, right. And it's a very hard problem for calibration. I will talk about that in next slide. Yeah, probably. thank you. Um, so this slide shows the uh, constitutive equations, the key constitutive equations for our PSTM framework. So we have, uh, to predict the damage evolution, we have these uh, potential and corresponding uh, evolution equations uh, to predict the uh, damage. And then we can uh, put the damage into this uh, stress strain relationship. Uh, that then, so as you can see, this fourth order damage, uh, this fourth order tensor in our constitutive equations, uh, they control how the, when the damage will initiate and how the damage will evolve. Therefore, they should be present. Uh, they should embed the information of the microstructure descriptors as and also the evolving material damage state. Therefore, we need to find. This, these are the constituted parameters that should be parameterized using machine learning in, um, according to our microstructure response database generated. And uh, so the loss function for this problem is just based on this damage evolution. Uh, we can write this loss function as a in a least square uh, sense. And we minimize this uh, L function by calibrating, by finding appropriate functional forms of this PIJKL. Uh, as, as I said, uh, because it is high dimension input problem, uh, it is uh, essential that we, we cannot just do a um, brute force uh, machine learning. We have to add the some physical uh, interpretations in this functional implementation. And this is the function form that we use at the end. So um, we split the PIJ call function uh, in terms of the average response and the variational response. So where the average response, as we know, the fiber volume fraction um, affects this uh, damage response throughout the deformation process. It affects the damage growth rate, the initial stiffness, uh, and so on. Therefore, this part of the equation should be activated throughout this deformation process. However, at some, um, certain damage mechanisms are more related to this local uh, fiber matrix morphology. Therefore, uh, we put that part, uh, we make it as function of this fiber spatial distributions, and they only activate at certain damage levels. These are based on our understanding of the damage mechanisms and the macromechanical simulation that we performed. And for the average response, we use a uh, symbolic regression to uh, identify the functional forms in terms of the fiber volume fraction and evolving damage state, this WD. So for example, this A10 parameter represents the effect of the evolving material damage state. And this A12 represents the effect of fiber volume fraction on the material uh, damage behavior. And for this uh, variational part, 
as we know, it, it is associated with um, the effect of different failure mechanisms at certain damage uh, levels. Therefore, we use a, a series of uh, Gaussian distribution functions to represent the effect of these failure mechanisms. For example, this CM represents the activation energy of uh, a certain uh, damage, uh, a certain failure mechanism at, at, uh, at this level. And this B parameter represents this, what's the effect of the, this failure mechanism or the, what's the effect of fiber spatial distribution on the uh, material damage behavior. And because at, uh, it, is a, it has a dimension of 30, which is uh, complicated, therefore we have to use uh, this uh, ANN to calibrate, what, to study what's the connection between these ramps and this B parameter. So this figure is just showing uh, the, this a series of Gaussian distribution functions that we used here with increasing uh, energy dissipation. So this is uh, the neural network that we uh, have for, uh, for the problem to connect this uh, RAMs and B parameters. So the input is the beta parameters, which has three dimension and output is uh, this B parameter that we identified uh, in the previous slide. So in total, we have 600 microstructure or data points for this problem and we split the data. And uh, so what we find out is that um, for all the B parameters, we only use uh, two hidden layers and we use uh, within 10 neurons in each layer. And that's, these are the transfer functions that we used. For the output layer, we use a linear transfer function and uh, nonlinear transfer functions between hidden layers. And here's one of the training results uh, for one of the B parameters, B111 actually. And as you can see, we can get pretty good uh, correlation for all training sets, for all, all the speed sets. Therefore, uh, this concludes our calibration of this PIG call functions. And for example, the weight of this uh, layer could could tell us like how much, uh, how important this particular beta parameter is actually connected to a particular damage parameter, a particular constituted parameter. And with that, we can uh, put, we can validate our category model against this uh, homogenized macromechanical response. As you can see, the category model can capture the effect of the fiber volume fractions as well as different uh, fiber distributions. So here, the macro one and macro two has the same fiber volume fraction, but different spatial distributions. And we can capture this uh, variation in this region. And in terms of the computational efficiency, as you can see, there's uh, we use we just need one element for the PSM approach, and uh, about several several orders of uh, computation efficiency compared with the micromechanical approach. And it is also in, uh, easy to integrate with F FM codes. We can just uh, implement this uh, PHC model as a UMAT or VUMAT and perform structural analysis and material design. And I think that is uh, what I have for this. Thank you very much. So uh, we go to the last part of the talk and that can, I, can I sorry? Can I have a very quick question? Um, is the is the one element solution a representative of one realization of the very detailed problem? Is it representative of the expectation of many different microscopic copies? Uh, is it clear, maybe, some of what it is that I'm trying to ask? Was yeah, yeah. So, so at this point. Yeah, this, this corresponds to, because, you know, the PHCDM, you know, what you have is explicit forms of, in this case, you know, for the uh, composites, it will have the principal components, okay, of that given microstructure. But, you know, we are at, at our liberty to change those PCAs within the constitutive law to generate as many realizations as we want. So to develop like a stochastic envelope for this, we can do it extremely quickly. Okay, yeah, that's what I was asking, thank you. 
All right, so the last part is fatigue modeling, fatigue crack modeling for super allies by uh, George Weber, also another postdoc, postdoctoral fellow in my group. Do I have control? Yes, I you have. I just sent a request if, if that came through. Uh, I think you have already. Let's try. My cursor is, I need to change my pointer option. Okay. Okay. Now, I now I have it. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so my name is George Weber. I'm just going to be talking about fatigue crack modeling of super alloys. Um, so in this problem, it's a little bit different than some of the PATM concepts that they were discussing. So in this case, um, we're going to be developing a data-driven Bayesian crack nucleation model. Um, and so the objective here is to try to combine um, some experimental data along with an automated uh, multi-scale simulation engine so that we can develop a crack nucleation criteria um, for this particular material, nuclei superallies. Uh, so in this one, we have a set of fatigue experiments. So again, a number of microstructures. And for each of these, um, we've had experimental loading, uh, cyclic loading that eventually leads to some fatigue crack nucleation along some, some grain boundary within the microstructure. Um, and so what we'd like to do then, we've, they've, they've um, our collaborators have characterized these crack nucleation locations. Um, and so what we'd like to do is now simulate these microstructures and then see um, at the material state that's being simulated at these microstructures, see uh, what's corresponding basically to these crack nucleation uh, sites that we're seeing in the experiments. And so in order to do that, um, we have a number of different fatigue experiments in, in, this, in this problem classified. We need to basically run through and automatically simulate all these, um, gather the material state data at every point. So stresses, strains, um, plastic slip. And then we like to then bring this up um, through a machine learning model into some classification of how can we tell um, if a material point is gonna be cracked or not cracked. Um, and so ideally we like to do this probabilistically. Um, so we're doing a supervised Bayesian approach um, in order to construct this. So I'm briefly just gonna say a little bit about the experimental work. Um, oh, so first, uh, so there's a, a few different steps to, to going through this procedure. So first, just doing that experimental testing and characterization, which is done from some of our collaborators at UCSB, um, building out this uh, concurrent, con concurrent multi-scale model um, and embedding these, these 2D microstructures for an accurate simulation of the boundary conditions, um, and then creating a database um, of all the microstructure state variables that, that, we're, that we care about, that they may influence the crack nucleation criteria, um, and then building out that criteria. So given a state of material, what is the probability of observing a crack at that particular location? Um, so but the experiment- you need, you need to move a little fast, okay? Sure. Um, so, so in this case, we have about 12 microstructures. And for each one, you can see uh, we have some, some points that are labeled as a crack site. Um, and so these are, this is basically the data set that's gonna be simulated and then, and then used for prediction. Um, and so a lot, of, a lot of experiments show that basically we can do this predictive behavior. Um, <clears throat> now we're gonna build a concurrent multi-scale model. So all of our data is basically two-dimensional. So we do this extension into a multi-scale simulation where we embed um, these microstructures, which we're gonna simulate with high fidelity crystal plasticity um, into a higher scale constitutive model, which we've already done like a calibration um, to get that same equivalent homogenized response. And then we're gonna use this simulation domain um, as the one to generate uh, all the microstructural state data um, that's gonna be used for the simulations. Um, so once we do all those embeddings and, and meshing, uh, we simulate these in finite elements under cyclic loading. Um, and then we can now look at all the different heterogeneous fields. So there's, there's tons of um, different fields that, that can be calculated. We've highlighted about 10 of them here, um, which if you look in the literature are usually the, some of the core variables that are used in crack nucleation um, criteria. 
and then also the gradients of these criteria as well. So things just like stresses, energies, plasticity, um, and then resolved shear stresses. This is a metallic material. So this is essentially going to bring our data set. So after doing all those loadings, we now have this data set of fields, um, and for each and for each one, we know exactly where these crack nucleation um, occurrences are happening. So that that's going to comprise our our classification data set. Um, so what we'd like to do now is to build a probabilistic model. And so we do this through um, a Bayesian framework. So again, given a state of material, what is the prob probability of observing a crack at that location? Um, and so, so we can just do Bayes' rule um, to start to, to initiate this, this, this model. Uh, we can, I have also this C term here, but we can ignore that for now. It's another material parameter. Uh, that, that's a sufficiency criteria. But essentially, um, there's... There's four things. So we, we're trying to construct this posterior distribution. Uh, we have two different likelihoods and then prior distributions. So for the priors, I'm not going to talk much about them, but they can, we can approximate them through um, looking at observed crack volumes. Uh, but what, I'm, what we're interested in is in order to construct this posterior is how to get an accurate represent, representation of, of these joint distributions that are our likelihood functions. And, and especially for you know, a large data set of different state variables, these, these different state variables, you have two different stresses, they can be highly covariant um, with each other. And so often that causes some problems. And also we have a lot of state variables. So I showed 10 there and then there are gradients. So we have 20 different, a 20 dimensional set for this joint distribution. So we'd like to do some approximation method um, for these likelihood functions. And then that will give us our posterior that we're interested in. And so we go about doing that um, through a Natoff transformation method. Um, so the, the whole goal is basically to approximate those likelihood functions. And the Natoff uh, is essentially a copula method, which <clears throat> is a set of three different mappings. Um, so this is our, our CDF for, for the corresponding uh, PDF of the likelihood. And we, and we break this up into um, three different mappings. The first is we take our data set, which are our, our different state variables, and we map them onto uh, marginally uniform random variables. Um, just in the standard way with using the CDF, the marginal CDFs. Um, we can then, okay, and then we can then uh, standardize each of these variables um, by using a, a standard normal di distribution, um, inverting it. And then finally, um, basically, essentially uh, finding the multivariable normal distribution in this new transform space um, that corresponds. And we can essentially do this by finding a covariance matrix. Um, which is an, uh, an un unbiased estimation of the covariance matrix will basically construct this, this entire model for us. So just to visualize what happened here, so I'm, I'm projecting this down in 2D so you can see basically the PDF of the data. Um, so for in the two-dimensional case, we have um, some, some data set like this that looks over all of our microstructures. Um, we then go ahead and do that mapping into, uni into marginally uniform space. And then again, um, then doing that standardized mapping uh, which can bring us into um, a standardized space where this is much easier to get a grasp of um, through an analytical expression rather than having to do some sort of MCMC sampling or something like that. So then we have an exact expression um, that we can that we can fit basically to this to this space, and and so that's what we're going to do. We're going to um, fit a multivariate distribution um, to this this, and then this allows us by differentiating that Natoff transformation equation that I showed, we can then basically map this um, back into our observed space um, and we can, we can identify pretty um, difficult um, distributions to handle uh, relatively easily. Um, so you could see like this is maybe not uh, immediately clear um, how to analytically represent this, this distribution, uh, but that basically allows us to have that model for it. And so now once we have our likelihoods, um, we basically have solved the problem, um, but still we, we don't wanna have a 20 dimensional space, um, a 20 dimensional PDF uh, to represent this, just in terms of computational time and other, and other worries. Um, so instead of calculating this for all 20 state variables and, and doing this, this model selection through that, let's instead build this model incrementally. Um, and so th what this is going to allow us to do is as we're building this model up, um, we're going to assess the relevance of each state variable, and then we're going to eventually cut this model to reduce the order of the final model. 
Um, and so I'm given the selection algorithm here, but essentially the idea is we're, we're gonna look for the top, the top most important state variables. So I, I use the term K star here. We can imagine this as, let's try to find the top three state variables. Um, this is the vector of state variables that the, the random vector that we're gonna be look, searching for. So at first we're gonna let it be empty. Um, and then we're gonna try to build up this, this state variable. So at first we're gonna have a test state variable. So for let's, let's try a particular state variable. Let's train the model, just as I said, build up those likelihoods and then you can get the posterior from there. And that's gonna give us the posterior distribution. So in the first case, this, was, this is the null set. So basically we're just trying this one state variable. Try this one a variable, build, a, build this model, and then assess the predictive behavior of it. So essentially this sort of objective function is, just, is saying, uh, let's, let's sum over all the data that I know is cracked and predict the probability that it's actually cracked. Um, and then we could take the, the exponential, um, the geometric mean of, of this prediction. Um, and this gives us basically a metric um, to define, uh, to, to compare different models, to compare across models. Um, and so by doing so, we then do this for each of our state variables, state variables individually, um, and then find which one, which one max, uh, that's actually supposed to be maximizing um, this, this, this ability to be correct, and then add this onto our model. And so this, so in the first time, first time around on this algorithm, we add the most informative state variable that's most predictive um, of the correct nucleation sites. The second time around, we fix, we've fixed our state variable, our first state variable, and we're seeing what other state variable um, best enhances that that ability to predict. And for this, for the second one, if it's very covariant with the first one it's most likely not gonna add additional information. So what this does is it's able to differentiate out, do we need you know, multiple measures of stress or maybe stress and plasticity combined can be the most important. So we've gone through this um, for a number of different ways. Um, so I'm showing here doing it for the case of K star equals three. So what happens is that it, it's able to pick out from the data, the three most important state variables um, that you know, in terms of what adds the, the most additional information to the predictive behavior. And so in this case, it picked out the von Mises stress, the maximum plastic slip rate, and the plastic defect energy. And what this now allowed us to do is, so not only this is already built a model, but it, it these each of these things correspond to a, a very unique um, mechanistic uh, behavior that we've seen in different experimental literature. So from here, we've, we've actually constructed a model later from this, but I'm not gonna show it here. Um, but it also just allows us to now make predict predictions of crack nucleation on top of these different microstructures. So now we can be given a particular microstructure and given this microstructure, um, we can just overlay basically the probability of, of observing a crack at different locations. And so you can see sort of the validation of this that, that yes, it, it is you know, able to show um, predictions at every location and, it, and does a good job of matching the, the actual crack nucleation site of the experiment. Okay. Thank you, George. So I'll just wrap up by saying that we are developing, have developed significant new methods, hierarchical multi-scaling coupling computational mechanics, thermodynamics, ICME machine learning, data-driven modeling for extreme events. I'm sorry. Uh, machine learning provides the essential framework for connecting higher scale response functions to the lower scale material descriptors and provides a new pathway for location specific materials design. And our methods are currently being used and I should say tested for real application by several industrial partners like Pratt & Whitney, GE, Rolls-Royce and so on. Thank you. I think that's all I had to say or we had to say. I want to say that, you know, both Shravan and George are postdocs, but they also did their PhDs with me. Okay, so this was continuation of some of their PhD work. Thank you very much, Samnath. That was very, very, very impressive. Novelty all over the place. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Yeah, so. Uh, I, I was interested, I mean, all, all parts very interesting uh, parts. Uh, uh, just one point about the um, 
the Bayesian framework because uh, we just put on the on the web something new, which is an extension of, and I think would simplify some of what George was talking about. Uh, we call it functional priors, learning functional priors and posteriors using physics and um, <clears throat> historical data actually and physics, data and physics we call it. And I can see a lot of, um, and, and one, of, one of the items there is that we use uh, a, a GAN, a, a generative adversarial network, together with historical data to generate um, a very informative priors. And you don't really care about the NATAF transformation, uh, which is elegant and so on. And of course, it's always better to put it, but, but uh, it's, uh, to uh, have explicit, but it's difficult. I mean, it's, it makes it a little more complicated as opposed to sort of black boxes. Uh, because, because so, so we sort of create a black box. Uh, I, th I think, you know, George, this sounds fascinating. And maybe George Weber and I, we can have a separate conversation. Yeah, yeah. Shuhui, Shuhui Meng is actually the, he's a postdoc here who developed this. I just showed it to DARPA a couple of days ago because we, we did a 100 dimensional uh, problem with porous media, you know, hydraulic activity. But your, your problems are actually more interesting, actually, for this uh, application because, uh, and, and, and so that's one comment. The other comment is, um, and, and I think Xiaofan was showing 600 microstructures. And I was wondering uh, if, um, you know, one of the things, of course, in, in, in our fields, in science and mechanics or whatever, we don't have enough data, even from, compu from com coming from computers, from molecular dynamic simulation. So do you guys use any data augmentation methods, which we find it very, very necessary in some of our applications, for example? In other words, um, not just using rotations and uh, translations and so on of what you have, but but actually uh, a sort of fake label, label labels or mix up. And there's a there's a host of of uh, data augmentation techniques now that takes what you have like 600 and make it look like 20,000. Yeah, uh, that could be applied. That'd be great. I mean, we explicitly run those 600 microstructures. That is very expensive. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, so, so there is also policies on what is a good data augmentation. So we have it from other fields, but we also learn it from uh, some collaborators we have uh, from Stanford, computer scientists actually. They show us in other contexts, and then we try to apply it into our context. But I, I, I want to. But, but those data augmentation methods would conform to the physics constraints, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can make it actually. That you can, you can. Uh, yes, yes. Um, but anyway, that, that is a couple, a couple of. Uh, I, I don't know some data. Do you have any, any or Do you have any questions? Uh, yeah, actually, I have one comment about the this presentation. So I, I remember that previously there uh, some content about the um, like uh, using the already existing analytical uh, analytical forms of the. Uh, constitutive models of uh, plasticity or crystal plasticity are used. Uh, what I'm thinking about is that, yeah, uh, although they work quite well in many of the situations, what I'm thinking about is, uh, as George mentioned, the function. So basically, the function prior, what it does is to learn the pattern, uh, learn the pattern of uh, what the material behavior is like for a class of materials, and while at the same time leave remain some uh, variation in that type. So uh, yeah, what I'm thinking is that maybe we can also do something that is make, use less assumptions regarding the constitutive models. So currently use some formulations of uh, like plasticity or, or crystal plasticity or which are quite strong assumptions, I will say. It's strong so that there are only a few parameters remaining. And maybe we can so somehow slightly weaken, make, weaken that those assumptions and uh, yeah, but still make the framework no, thermodynamically. No, no, no. I, yeah, yeah, I, I see what you're saying. But the, the thing is, our framework is very general. So it is, you know, the framework is based on thermodynamics to achieve all possible states. Okay. Uh -huh. so within those, the coefficients are the controlling parameters. 
right? So the coefficient, depending on, so, so you know, the truth model here is the micromechanical model. That, that, that is for sure. So we are, uh, we, we are what the micromechanical mechanical model can give us. But at the higher scale, if we let machine learning do everything, the worry is that the physics constraints will not be enforced. And you know, you, you can do it in very simple models, like maybe elasticity or something, but a model where there are so many dimensions, you know, the physics mm -hmm. constraints are absolutely necessary. Mm -hmm. We are letting the machine learning actually provide, you know, sufficient information within these windows that are otherwise left within that generalized framework. That generalized framework is very, very general, okay? Uh, depending on the particular material, some of them, you know, some of these terms may also turn out to be uh, within the null set, you know, something uh, may not contribute, okay? Mm -hmm. so our main framework is very general. But it for but it conforms to the requirements. You know, for example, I, I'll, I'll just say a simple thing. You need objectivity, and this came up, right? Objectivity means yeah. material frame invariance. If you are not careful about the data set, your machine learning, the training may not provide you adequate constraints there. So we need to create this framework where that material frame inver invariance and objectivity are a priori satisfied, okay? So that, that is my philosophy of, of these PHCDMs, the PHCM models. Yeah, I completely agree. So yeah, one of the thing is, of course we need to definitely always keep the physics or mechanics here, like thermodynamics, objectivity, some translation or some other inv invariances. Yeah, yeah, what I'm thinking is just to use machine learning to do everything beyond this physical principle and do those all, replace all these assumptions. Very artificial. May, may, maybe, I, maybe, maybe you can, you can uh, do it. I, I don't know, you know, at least when I started about thinking about this, I, 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 I may not have been that confident, but you know, the machine learning is evolving rapidly. So maybe yeah. in the current state, it is possible, yeah. yeah. Yeah, but that's an excellent point. Thank you. Hi, Professor Ghosh. Uh, this is Ming Lang. I have a, uh, I have uh, two questions. So uh, uh, my first question is: so how did you, did you test your machine learning model on doing, let's say, extrapolation? Maybe you have some point that is uh, like outside your like your data sets. So you have your. Uh, in, uh, your expression uh, acquired from your uh, machine learning model. How, how is the extrapolation performance? Thank you, that's a great question. I think uh, Shravan can say, yes, we have. I think we have done this a lot. Mm -hmm. And you can just... Yeah, so the, the, the microstructures <laughs> that we have used uh, in the training data set, those are synthetic. Uh, but when we were validating our models, those came from real experiments. So. We, we get the microstructure from the real EBSD scans uh, and then we test them. So they may not necessarily be like very close to the data set that we have. So, so far the experimental validations that we have done for different allies, they were performing well, uh, I mean, in terms of the accuracy. Okay, great, thanks. <coughs> and uh, uh, my second question is, um, I would like to ask your uh, insight on um, uh, maybe uh, inferring like parameters for uh, uh, biomaterial because I'm doing like uh, biomechanics. So uh, the material in biomechanics are, are, are basically uh, the hyper, -elast hyper elasticity. So uh, I, I wonder if you can extend this, your methodology or, or framework into like inferring the expression for uh, hyper elastic. No, that. absolutely. Yeah. I mean, this is a very, very general framework. Okay, uh, there are no uh, no restrictions whatsoever. Okay, so uh, yes, absolutely, and I'm confident that this framework can be nicely adapted to various different types of materials. Yes. Great. Great. Thank you. Yeah. You're welcome.
Tomlath, both Enrui and uh, Minlang are working with uh, Jay Humphrey on bio oh, materials, okay. actually okay. fracture and damage in uh, uh, using machine learning. And uh, so, so, they, so that's why they, 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 they care about it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. It's not I mean, just curiosity, but uh, some data. Do you have a question? Maybe the last question? No, sir, I don't have any question. Everything was crystal clear. No, I'm reading. <laughs> I'm still on reading the paper, so I don't have any question. Right. Maybe Can I ask a question? Yes, yeah, sure. Uh, Professor Ghosh, this is Raj from Brown. So, hello. Uh, Hi. Hello. Yeah. Actually, we are uh, also trying to uh, like compute the microstructure of nickel material using the wave field data. So, there, what we try to do, like, uh, uh, like pair the Newton's second law of motion with the basic Hooke's law. But the model was pretty much homogenized. So will it be prudent to use this constitu constitutive relation with the uh, equation of motion to get a better uh, parameter estimation for the material? Yeah, this is very realistic, right? I mean, normally, yes. so what we tried to show here is yes. normally when people get these phenomenological models mm -hmm. and calibrate a few of the parameters from limited experiments, Yes. Yeah, we are actually missing out a huge amount with respect to the material space, with respect to the uh, you know the space of variety of loads and things like right. that. So yeah. what we try to show through this is that the the breadth of a constitutive law can be much more than are typically projected in conventional phenomenological models. So you know. Absolutely, your your model can uh, uh, you know your your, your uh, uh, you know your uh, applications can use some of these techniques that we are, uh, we are uh, so so I'm not, so actually uh, Raj already is using some of your software. I told you he's using uh, yes. Dream 3D. Oh, okay, good, good. <laughs> he's using yes. Dream 3D to to uh, he's using uh, he works with the Air Force uh, for non-destructive evaluation of materials. So we have yes. real data, but then out at, out of plane or in certain directions we don't have data. So we yes. we um, create synthetic data for that using Dream 3D, one grain at a time. Yeah, and, yeah, and, and actually, so so that's uh, when, when we so, built Dream 3D in the mid 2000s. There was nothing like that. So, you know, mm -hmm. one day I was sitting with my PhD student, Mike Graber, who, is, who, is, uh, who were developed, actually who went to Air Force. Air Force gave him all the money to make his PhD code much more available and user-friendly. And that's what Dream 3D became. Okay, so, uh, you know, one day Mike and I, we were just sitting in my office and, you know, talking about, you know, major bottlenecks. And the first bottleneck was, you know, the Air Force was at that time developed FIB, focused ion beam based, uh, you know, microstructures. Uh, mm, and, mm. and we were like, how do we use that in our computations? And uh, that, that was the genesis of, you know, uh, how Dream yeah. 3 And, and it, it has become very powerful tool that people use. Yeah. So yeah. Our yeah. Main, main predicament with the... Uh, oh. Yeah, it produced realistic structures. That's what I yeah. think. That's what we got from the Air Force from uh, Jim Blackshire. We gave yeah, us the yeah. data. Yeah, we're still, yeah, we're still yeah. working. It's an ongoing project. Yeah, yeah, that's good. That's great. Uh, hopefully, your all this all this uh, development that you have for uh, super alloys, titanium composites, everything will become a uh, popular code. Also, <laughs> yeah, we are. You know, I I tried getting some NSF funds to create a software hub. My NSF did not give me the funds, so I'm I'm looking for because you know there is a demand. So uh, we are trying to create some portals uh, where people can use our. Yes. You know, so. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, thank you very much, uh, all all the speakers, and that was uh, that was a great treat today. Uh, with yeah, listen to three different talks. That's great. Thank you very much. Uh, I mean, like maybe you can proceed with the thank yous and the next two speaker. Thank, thank sure. you very much, George. I have to leave, but, uh, you know, thanks. It's great meeting all of you. And, you know, let's be in touch. You know, I'd love to work with your group to sure. yeah. advance in certain areas, okay? I'm here, yeah. Thanks a lot. Okay, talk right. to you then. Bye. Right. Thank you. Thank you, all the speakers for the uh, in the first talk.
So let's move on. So today our second speaker is Dr. Matthew Colebrook. Uh, Dr. Matthew Colebrook is a junior research fellow uh, at Trinity College, Cambridge. He completed his PhD at the University of Cambridge, supervised by Professor Anders Hansen. His work concerns the developments of algorithms related to spectral theory, solutions of PDEs, neural networks, compressive sensing, and the inverse problems. So he is also a recipient of the IMA Prize uh, 2021. So, so today he will be giving us a talk with title, with title, Can Stable and Accurate Neural Networks Be Computed? on the barriers of deep learning and SMILE's 18th problem. So without further ado, please join me and welcoming our second speaker. Great, well, thank you for the introduction and thank you for the invitation. It's a, uh, it's a pleasure to be speaking to you. So uh, as it was said, I'm gonna talk about uh, neural networks and whether they can be computed as stable and accurate neural networks in the context of um, image um, reconstruction or denoising. So before I proceed, with explaining a bit about that. I should say this is joint work with uh, Vega Anton at the University of Oslo, and also Anders Hansen, who was my supervisor at Cambridge. Uh, you can find our paper uh, with a very simple title on the archive, and also our code uh, is on GitHub. I will post these slides on my website after the talk, uh, so don't worry about uh, the link or anything like that. Okay, so I thought I'd start with a, uh, a fun slide. So um, as we all know, the interest in deep learning uh, has really grown exponentially over the last few years. So uh, a few months ago, I typed into Google uh, deep learning and got about two and a half billion hits. And then I thought, okay, well, what about something like computational mathematics, which is perhaps uh, broader, but this yielded only 150 million hits. So really there, there's a lot of interest surrounding these uh, areas. And you can see that in this uh, graph here, which plots the um, number of machine learning papers on the archive per year. So if you uh, set yourself the foolish task of trying to read every single one of these during the pandemic, uh, you'd have to continually read a paper in every under five minutes. Uh, so it's really uh, exciting to see this field uh, grow so much. Okay, so why is AI suddenly such a big deal? Uh, we've prob we're probably all aware of these types of applications. So for example, AI techniques are replacing humans in problem solving, so self-driving cars, even mathematical proofs and things like that. But I'm going to focus more on AI techniques replacing established algorithms in the sciences. So perhaps the audience is more familiar with uh, this uh, sort of revolution in PDEs. Uh, instead, I'm going to be focusing more on uh, medical imaging uh, and imaging problems in, uh, in general. So hopefully, uh, even if your background isn't in uh, imaging, you, you'll get a flavor of this kind of things that um, can happen. Okay, so. The first question you might ask is, will AI replace standard algorithms in medical imaging? So this paper appeared in Nature a couple of years ago. Uh, we'll come back to it with a numerical example later. And one of the claims, so, so this was for a, a neural network trained to uh, reconstruct MRI data end to end. And one of the claims was that uh, this, this method of doing things yields a superior immunity to noise and a reduction in uh, artifacts compared to uh, standard handcrafted uh, methods. Okay, so this, this looks fantastic. And then there was a follow-up paper uh, saying that uh, you get the, the three uh, ideal things you want in a method, uh, improved speed, accuracy, and uh, robustness. So pay particular attention to this, uh, this word robustness because we'll revisit this claim uh, towards the end of this talk and uh, we'll, uh, I'll provide some, some thoughts on this as well. Okay, so I'm glossing over a whole Whole field here. I haven't really had time to present lots of different papers, but there's really a very strong optimism and confidence uh, in deep learning. So Jeffrey Hinton, one of the godfathers uh, of, of deep learning, declared rather boldly in 2017 that they should stop training uh, radiologists now. Okay, so if you stopped here, you, you might think, okay, this is, this is fantastic. We've got all these amazing new techniques, but uh, as I'm hopefully going to show you with some examples, you have to be a bit cautious. So there's also a, an increased awareness of uh, potential dangers with these types of methods. So in particular for image reconstruction, uh, machines can uh, hallucinate. So th this has been coined uh, AI-generated hallucinations. 
So for example, if you um, take a scan of the brain, uh, the machine might think there's uh, a tumor or something when there isn't or uh, vice versa. And this isn't just some sort of a weird mathematical curiosity that uh, doesn't happen very often. This can also happen uh, in real life, as we'll see uh, later on. So this is, this is an, an example, a sad example of uh, Uber's self-driving car killing a pedestrian uh, due to a false positive. So that's when the machine thinks there's nothing there when there is. So in this case, the, the machine had been trained to ignore things like uh, plastic bags floating across the road. Uh, and this meant that it didn't recognize the uh, pedestrian in time. Okay, so you've, you've got to be careful for high stake applications in particular that you have stable methods. When I say images, you probably think of things like adversarial examples for image classification. So this is deep fool. This is uh, some really nice work here. So this is an example from their paper where you take a universal adversarial perturbation. So what that means is you, a very small perturbation that you add across different images. And this yields uh, misclassifications. So for example, this sock uh, becomes uh, elephants and this whale becomes um, an African gray. Okay, so that, that you might expect in classification because in some sense, this is a, an inherently um, discontinuous problem, right? You're approximating a discontinuous function. But if we go to inverse problems, uh, there's been a whole host over the last 50 years or so, a whole, whole sort of enterprise of developing stable and accurate methods, right? So we know that typically we can, we can actually do things and we can do them well. So it might come as a bit of a, as a bit of a surprise, this kind of uh, example can also occur in inverse problems. Okay, so this is a paper which involved two of my collaborators, uh, but not myself, so I, so I can uh, I can brag about it without being uh, being embarrassed. But th this is sort of uh, in, in this paper they showed that a similar type of adversarial example occurs in inverse problems. So you add a, a tiny perturbation to an image, or your um, samples, for example, MRI scans, and this yields a very big uh, difference in the output of the neural network. Okay, so let's look at, a, at, an, at an example of this. So here I've taken a neural network from uh, their paper, so uh, the original paper's down here, if you're interested. So this is MRI, 33% uh, subsampling. So you can think of MRI as a bit like the uh, discrete Fourier transform. And uh, the left image shows the, uh, the image. The right image shows the reconstruction of the neural network. So what the algorithm in this paper does is it searches for a small perturbation, at least to the eye, that uh, when you add to the image, incurs a large uh, perturbation in the output. Okay, so let's do that. I'll go backwards and forth uh, a couple of times. And it's quite hard to spot the difference on the left-hand side, right? But the right-hand side is very different. In particular, look at these two arrows. So this is an example of uh, AI-generated hallucinations. Okay, so um, I'm not a doctor, so I have no idea whether this is serious or not, but it looks, you know, th this, this uh, long, long thing here is closed, so it might, it, might, it might be quite important. Okay, so let's add larger perturbations, and you can see that uh, you get severe instabilities, which is a problem. Um, one thing I would say is that if you were a doctor and you saw this image on the right-hand side, you'd immediately know something was very off, but perhaps not with this more subtle uh, deformation here. So these, these types of um, hallucinations are perhaps more dangerous. Uh, so to show I'm not cheating, this is the reconstruction with a, a state-of-the-art handcrafted method. Uh, so in this case, I think it's a total variation minimization with shearlets. Um, okay, so... That's adversarial type perturbations. What about the random case? You might, you might argue, okay, well, that's a bit artificial in my MRI scan. Do I really have some mischievous uh, person uh, fiddling with the data to, to get the wrong uh, result? Well, you, you can also try and see what happens in the random case. So here on the top, I've got um, a, a blown up image of re the reconstruction with uh, standard handcrafted methods. On the bottom is the reconstruction of uh, the neural network. And what I'm doing is I'm just adding a random Gaussian noise in this case and taking the worst case over, say, 100, a sample size of, size of 100, uh, 20, and 1. And you can see, even in this random case, you still get these hallucinations. 
Okay, so in other words, this instability isn't just uh, a, a problem sort of artificially constructed examples, it, it can actually happen. Um, and you can see this with uh, Facebook and NYU's uh, fast MRI challenge. So you're probably familiar with ImageNet. So the, the, um, the competition for image classification. Uh, this is kind of like ImageNet for MRI. Okay, so um, a, a training data uh, will be released and then different groups compete to design uh, neural network methods that can then reconstruct and then they're tested. Um, so you can actually see the, the types of hallucin hallucinations you can get, for example, extra blood vessels in the brain and things like that. Um, so one, one of the tracks actually for, for the Fast MRI Challenge focused on these AI generated hallucinations. So it is really starting to become an issue um, for, for medical practice as well. Okay, so that's kind of a very broad uh, introduction. Um, one of the things I'd like to say is that Matthew, the, can the I ask a, can I ask a question? Yeah, of course. Here in the noise, when you um, let's say you use a gun and you uh, you can you you do have already those perturbations, right? So you could discriminate. I mean, if you have trained it properly with noise, like we we know we use uh, noise for data augmentation. Yeah. So if you um, already have done, if you have learned that, then you can you learn how to distinguish, right? Because the discriminator, that, that, if it's if it has been trained sufficiently, then it's stable to those perturbations. That, that's a very interesting point. And I'm going to come to that towards the end of the talk when I'm going to discuss the stability accuracy trade off with exactly that, that method of um, jittering, it's sometimes called, it's called as well, where you add um, random noise. And we're actually going to see that it can stabilize it, but there's also a potential uh, loss in accuracy as well. Um, so, yeah, I'll, I'll answer that perhaps towards the end when I've shown the. Uh, okay, shown the thank you. Um, yes, ex excellent point. So, so that's something to bear in mind, stability and accuracy. Uh, and we'll see that uh, going forward. Okay, so the optimism surrounding deep learning is perhaps similar to uh, the optimism that surrounded mathematics at the start of, start of the 20th century. So I want to sort of um, go off on a bit of a, uh, a, a different course now. So um, David Hilbert, shown on the right here, uh, he had a grand vision of providing secure foundations for the whole of mathematics. Okay, so this involved uh, the belief that all mathematics should be written in a precise formal language and manipulated according to uh, world of rules. There are three parts of this um, completeness, a proof that um, you can prove all true mathematical statements, consistency, a proof that you pay contradiction, and decidability, and this is particularly important, an algorithm for deciding the truth or falsity of any uh, mathematical statement. Okay, so um, you, you're probably all familiar, but, but Hilbert gave a list of uh, problems uh, at the ICM um, at the start of the 20th century. And his 10th problem was to provide an algorithm, which when given any Diophantine equation, so that's a polynomial equation with integer coefficients, uh, to decide whether or not there's an integer valued solution. And I want to draw particular attention to the way this is phrased provide an algorithm. Okay, so Hilbert here is very optimistic that there is an algorithm, we just need to find it. But of course, Hilbert was no fool and realized that these three, three things hadn't been proven yet. Okay, so you probably know where this is going, but uh, this optimism was really turned upside down to some effect by Gödel here on the, on the left and uh, Turing on the right. Um, and they showed that there are true statements in mathematics that cannot be proven and also problems that cannot be computed uh, by an algorithm. So, okay, you, you might think these guys are the, the ultimate party poopers of the 20th century, right? Uh, in some sense, as mathematicians, we want all of this to be true. But that's not the, the whole story because their work on foundations um, really fundamentally changed uh, modern logic and, and computer science uh, after the invention of the computer. Uh, and one thing I, I, I want to say is that looking at foundations, so figuring out what is possible and what is impossible, uh, although you might prove negative results, really leads to better understanding, uh, discovering the feasible directions for technique, and also actually discovering new, new methods as well. Uh, so Hilbert's 10th problem, by the way, uh, it was shown in the 70s that no such algorithm uh, exists. Okay, so uh, before I talk about inverse problems again, um, I really want to argue that a, uh, a similar foundations of deep learning and AI is needed. And this really presents a, an awesome opportunity for mathematicians. 
so Steve Smell, the, uh, the Fields Medalist, uh, gave a list of problems similar to Hilbert, but at the start of the 21st century. And his 18th problem, uh, he was ahead of his time really, uh, was what are the limits of artificial uh, intelligence? And a program determining uh, the foundations or limitations of deep learning uh, will typically look at two types of results. Uh, boundaries of methodologies, so that's saying you can or cannot do something with a particular method, uh, but also universal and intrinsic boundaries, for example, proving that no algorithm uh, can do this. And again, there's a key difference here between the existence of a method or a neural network that, that does something that we want and the construction or training of it. Okay, and that's something we'll see in, in the first theorem in the future size time. Um, and when you're answering these types of questions, it's really important to bear in mind the two pillars of numerical analysis, stability and accuracy. So accuracy perhaps has received uh, more attention in, until recently, uh, at least um, in, in the machine learning community. Okay, so the goal for the rest of this talk will be to develop some results uh, in this direction. Okay, so this is the setup. I have some modality A, some matrix, ma matrix uh, with fewer uh, rows in the columns. And I want to reconstruct a vector X for measurements AX plus uh, some possible noise or perturbations. So of course, this is an ill-posed problem in general, but we'll look at specific types of uh, X later on. So I'm gonna present a fundamental barrier Okay, saying when you can, oh, sorry, when, when you can't do this, no matter what the method. I'm then going to look at sufficient conditions which overcome this barrier and introduce fast iterative uh, restarted networks. And then finally, uh, going back to the question, uh, I, I'm going to look at balancing the stability and accuracy uh, trade off uh, in deep learning. And we're also going to revisit uh, the nature paper as well. Okay, so uh, very quickly, um, the types of um, images or, or vectors that I'm interested in reconstructing, you can roughly think of as close to being sparse. So for example, if you look at uh, things like wavelength levels and stuff like that. So the picture is this, we have a matrix, we have a vector, which is approximately sparse, and uh, we want to recover this vector from the measurements. And th these types of problems appear all over the place. I don't really have time to go through all of these examples, but it's not just the examples that I'm going to present uh, today. I'm going to particularly focus on uh, MRI or, or the discrete Fourier transform. Okay, so let's make our lives a bit simpler. So the first result I'm going to talk about uh, discusses three convex optimization problems, which are usually used uh, to reconstruct sparse vectors. So this is known as sparse regularization. Uh, so uh, this is basis pursuit denoising. So you minimize the L1 norm subject to a uh, a measurement condition. So eta could represent the noise, for example. Lasso, uh, which of course uh, everyone is probably familiar with. Something which is less familiar, uh, which is square root lasso. So without the square here, uh, that just makes uh, the results slightly stronger. I won't go into the details of that, but uh, yeah. So, so I'm gonna call these P1, P2 and P3. And very importantly, I'm not interested in the minimum of the objective function. So I don't care about the objective function. I care about the X. I care about the minimizer, right? I want to reconstruct this vector here. Uh, and why am I doing this rather than the inverse problem? Well, it avoids sort of bizarre pathological cases when I'm proving theorems. Uh, these solution maps, it can be multivalued by the way, but that doesn't really matter. Um, they're much simpler than the original inverse problem, right? So if you prove an impossibility result in this case, it's perhaps uh, stronger. But going full circle, deep learning has actually been started to uh, use, be used for, for solving these types of complex problems as well. Uh, so it's not just deep learning attacking the uh, original problem. It's also used to tackle these problems. Okay. So the first thing that might uh, pop into your head when you see something like this is the universal approximation theorem, right? So I'm, I'm not going to go into details of this because we're probably all familiar with it. But there's a whole zoo of, of different results which say, you know, if your activation function uh, satisfies certain properties, for example, it's not a polynomial, you can approximate uh, a continuous function on a compact interval to arbitrary accuracy if you have sufficient width. Um, but, okay, so there's a whole zoo of these in different function spaces and things like that. But we have to be very careful when we, we actually, you know, want to prove things that so, um, this perhaps isn't enough for two reasons. First of all, other methods, such as polynomials, 
splines, things like that, also have universal approximation theorems, right? So we have to ask the question, why are neural networks so effective? Well, it's to do with efficiency, perhaps. So there might be different classes of uh, functions that are efficiently approximated by neural networks, but not classical methods. So I'm not going to focus on this at all today, uh, but you can read a, an interesting paper here uh, on the archive about this. Uh, I'm more interested in the second problem, which is that even though there might exist some neural network out there that does something that we want, we want to construct or train it, right? We want an algorithm that does that for us. Uh, and this, this is a very uh, subtle problem, uh, it turns out. Okay, so what could go wrong when we want to, um, to, to get an algorithm to compute the neural network? Well, first of all, there might not exist such an algorithm. Oh, so, so, such a neural network, sorry. Uh, we know by um, the universal approximation theorem, I, I'll show you a theorem in a second, uh, that this doesn't happen. A second problem is that even if um, a good neural network exists, we might not be able to uh, construct it using an algorithm, right? And then a third problem might be that there exists an algorithm, but it's not feasible. For example, it might need uh, prohibitively uh, many training samples or training time to achieve uh, good accuracy. So we'll actually see that uh, these two problems uh, can occur for very natural uh, classes of, of these types of problems, uh, which is quite curious. Okay, so uh, the setup, and uh, I apologize for this slide, but I wanted to be uber precise about exactly what I, uh, I meant. So I'm going to consider the following. So I have a modality A, so that's my matrix, remember. I have a collection of samples, yk. So remember, yk are the, the vectors that I see, a, x, k, plus this noise. And given uh, such a collection of modalities and samples, I want to ask the question, does there exist a neural network approximating the solution map of my uh, convex optimization problems? OK. And if so, quick sorry, yeah. This is Yan Zhong from Brown. Uh, hi. Oh, hi. Uh, what do you mean by a neural network? Are you allowing a neural network that that can have like implicit layer? So um, that's a very good question. I'm, I'm using, so for the negative result I'll show in a second, it's independent of the architecture. But for the positive results I'll present later on, it's a standard feed forward uh, neural network. Uh, so actually, I think the, the construction we use uses square roots uh, activation functions, but it doesn't particularly matter. You, you, can, you can approximate them by the ReLU, for example, and, and everything follows through. So for example, uh, could you go back to your previous slide? Um, yeah, in, in this formulation, actually, we know that there is a state of the art algorithm that can solve this problem efficiently using L1 minimization, and there are many iterative solvers. But if you... Uh, if you did not, if you if you allow neural network to be quite general that allowed some implicit layers, then actually you can view as those algorithms as a just a big chunk of neural network that has implicit layers. Like one layer solves like L1 minimization parts, and the other layers so iterative parts. So that yeah, um, so in that's that that's, sense, that's exactly right. So yeah, so that's yeah. actually the uh, the motivation for the architecture. Uh, that we use uh, for our positive results uh, later on. But going back to your, your other points, um, so you're right in saying you can, you can, for example, minimize the objective function, but there's a very subtle non-computability result about the, the vectors, right? So there's, there's a big difference between getting the, the minimization vectors and getting the minimum of the objective function. Um, right. So I'll show a picture in a few slides time that sort of gives you intuition. You essentially get phase transitions where approximating the X is much more difficult than the, um, the objective function. And you need, you need conditions, uh, uh, for example, on your, on your matrix A that stop that happening. And that's exactly when you can um, get those iterative methods, unfold them okay, as a neural network, use that architecture, and then also prove results that allow you to reconstruct uh, the X. So yeah, that, that, that's, a, that's a brilliant question. And uh, uh, yeah, yeah it's, it's, it's exactly one, one of the motivations for, for what follows. OK, um, right. So uh, in practice, when we're given such a setup, we can't uh, store the matrix A, or we might not know it, uh, exactly on a computer. For example, if, it's, if it involves uh, rationals, 
cosine transform or something like that, we have to use uh, floats. So what we really have access to is uh, these A and these YK to any precision we want. Okay, so there's some Oracle or some other method uh, that my algorithm can query to approximate these, these guys to any desired accuracy. And I'm also gonna throw in some extra information to give it as much chance to succeed as possible, which is that it can also solve these um, approximation, uh, the, 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 uh, the optimization problem for the approximations as well. So don't worry so much if, if that is a bit heavy. The key thing is that I'm using a realistic uh, setup where I can only have access to data to uh, find a precision, but I can choose my method, how much precision that is. And I can adaptively uh, do that as my training uh, proceeds. Uh, so with that horrible slide finished, uh, good news, first of all, there is a neural network that uh, does what we want. And this just follows from the universal uh, approximation theorem. Okay, so if you're given a collection of modalities and samples, there's some map that goes from your training data to a neural network that, that gives you uh, a good approximation to the answer. But here's, here's the bad news. Um, and this is a long theorem, so I'm, I'm gonna take some time explaining it. Okay, so, so what you do is you take any of the PJ, so remember those convex problems, uh, convex optimization problems. You take any N, at least two. So N is the a dimension of the vector you're trying to recover. You take any M less than N. So that just means that the matrix is uh, matrix has fewer uh, rows than columns. And then pick any uh, integer K, bigger than two, and any integer, a uh, positive integer L. Then there exists a well-conditioned class, omega of elements of modalities and samples, such that the following holds. And by well-conditioned, I'm not gonna talk about this, but you can go through all the types of condition numbers you get for these standard optimization problems, and you can construct the class so that all of those are at least, are, are bounded by one. So I'm not constructing a weird sort of ill-posed problem, right? This is as nice as it gets. Okay, so for this class omega, the following three things happen simultaneously. Uh, there does not exist any algorithm that can achieve uh, K digits of accuracy on any uh, of my samples. And even if I allow my algorithm to do this probabilistically, it can't do it with a probability bigger than a half. Okay. At the same time, there does exist an algorithm that produces a neural network, which is accurate to uh, K minus one digits, uh, uniformly over the sample. However, and remember this is the problem of there exists an algorithm that it could, um, it, it might not be feasible. For any M, okay, and, and any positive integer M and probability P in this range here, you can choose an adversarial training set so that the probability of failing to get K minus one digits or needing a training data size bigger than M is at least P. But for the same class, you can get uh, K minus two digits uniformly across your samples with only L training data. Okay, so it's very subtle uh, to, to distinguish between these three cases, right? This is the worst case. This is uh, good, but not feasible. And then this is the best. Uh, so that's a bit of a mouthful, but in words, the, the theorem says the following. So there are nice classes omega where you can prove uh, neural networks of great approximation quality exist. So no algorithm, even randomized, can train a neural network accurate to k digits with probability greater than half. Uh, you can get k minus one digits, uh, but it requires arbitrarily many training data, uh, and uh, you can get k minus two digits with only tra uh, L training data. So I'll show you. An but real what is k? Example. Can you go back? What is k? I, I got confused. What is k? Oh, this is an excellent question. So k in this theorem is something that you fix, but if we actually go, for example, to here, um, what you can actually prove is that um, even for nicer classes, for example, classes that I'm gonna look at in a second, where you have assumptions on A that get rid of this annoying uh, behavior, uh, the K there will correspond to something proportional to the noise level. So there's this universal barrier that you can't get below, which kind of makes sense, right? That you can't do better than the noise. Uh, and you can actually I prove that. Because in the theorem, I, I understand the theorem. It just, but I, I'm trying. I'm trying to think ahead and see. Try to see what. Yeah. What K so is. A, How do I relate it? In other words, because K K minus one for us, we're doing practitioners of 
neural networks, we we lose digits all the time. So one more yeah. thing. <laughs> no, no, exactly. So, so for the theorem, K is fixed, and then I construct a class omega. Um, and re really, this perhaps it would make more sense with relative error, but you can you can get the same result for for relative uh, error as well. Um, so, so, so K is fixed, and then the omega depends on the K. Uh, but for real applications, you actually see K uh, popping up. Um, I'll show a picture of, of this later on, where you see uh, nice exponential convergence in the number of layers until you hit that that boundary, and then it plateaus. Um, and you can show that it's a universal thing you can't get can't get rid of, at least in these and uh, that, times. And, and you're saying that that's that's due to approximation, not due to optimization. No, it, yeah, it, it's uh, so it's independent of uh, your architectural method of reconstruction. So it's essentially due to the fact that you don't have exact uh, input. Okay. Um, okay, so yeah, so this is independent of neural network architect architecture. And the take home message, sorry, uh, Yeah, this is Yanjong again. Uh, in, in, the, in the proof, does it use some impossibility theorem that is known in the literature? That, 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 uh, you're thinking something like the whole thing problem. Uh, so in the proof of the theorem, does it use some impossibility theorem? Uh, so so, so you would, what you do, um, so I'll give away the idea, is you, you, build, um, you build phase transitions for these problems, right? So this, this is the L1 ball in two dimensions. Uh, this might be your, your hyperplane uh, describing your objective function. Uh, if it touches a vertex here, the solution is this, this corner, right? Change it slightly, uh, you get a whole phase of solutions. Change it again, you go back to a vertex. So this phase transition is sort of the universal mechanism. You have to play around a bit with um, the, to, to make things well conditioned and things like that. But essentially, so, so this, this is quite different to the standard impossibility theorems that sort of appear, appear in the literature. And you can prove that this is independent at least parts of the theorem, I won't go into right. details of which parts, are independent of the model of computation. All right, so even, even if you could, for example, solve the halting problem and uh, other similar impossibility theorems that you have in computability, it still, uh, it still holds as well. I see, I see. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so um, to conclude this, this section, uh, the theorems on existence of neural networks uh, may sometimes have little to do with what you actually produce in practice. So here's an example for um, a discrete cosine transform. Okay, so here I'm uh, taking a very small matrix, 19 by 20. Okay, discrete cosine transform, 8,000 samples for training. The solutions are six sparse, right? So it's a very nice problem. Uh, I'm going to compare Finex, so those are the neural networks I'll, I'll talk about later in this column here. Lister, which you can think of as uh, exactly like uh, you were saying earlier, a, a learned version of um, iterative uh, algorithms, so this is this column here. And these are the K, right, and correspond to the different, uh, different omega. So you can see that even as you increase your accuracy that's given to the algorithm, right, you still can't get past this fundamental barrier. So you, you actually see it in, in, in practice. Uh, I was gonna show a live MATLAB demonstration for Lasso, but uh, I didn't have time, but you can ask me about that if you're interested. Okay, uh, so I've shown this. Uh, so the question is, can we avoid uh, this, this case of phase transitions, right? So if we're given a, a, uh, an optimization problem, can we find good input passes where if we get, a, uh, a cl get close to the minimum of the objective function, okay, so this inequality here, uh, does that mean that we can get close to the, uh, the actual vector that we want to recover? And we'll see that the answer is yes. Uh, and for those of you who, who know things about complex sensing, this, this hopefully shouldn't seem to Alien. Okay, so uh, a big long definition. Don't worry so much about this. The key point is that I'm now going to change the model of vectors that I want to reconstruct slightly uh, to a more sort of state of the art uh, method. So I'm going to look at vectors which are approximately uh, sparse in levels. So, for example, if this is your image uh, written as a vector and these are the wavelet levels, you might consider different sparsities uh, in each level. And then I'm going to look at a distance function, sigma SM, of a vector x to this, uh, this manifold of uh, SM sparse vectors. 
uh, just measured in, in a weighted L1 norm. Don't worry about the weights. It's just something that you can, you can choose optimally. It's, it's, it's a prior on, on the type of vector. Okay, so given that, um, hopefully the final scary definition is this, which is that, uh, th so this is an assumption on your matrix A, which allows you to get that key crucial property. So this property here, uh, and this is a, a generalization of the robust null space property, so in levels. So essentially this means that if, um, if you take an SM sparse vector, uh, sorry, support set delta, and any vector, when you look at X restricted to that support set, you can bound the L2 norm of that by some constant times the, the norm on uh, the complement uh, plus uh, a multiple of the norm of A of X. Okay, so in some sense, this, this, is, this, this is a um, assumption that involves the kernel of A and also uh, sparse vectors. We'll see later that you can actually prove this occurs in natural examples as well. But the key, the key uh, thing to remember from this slide is that if you assume the matrix satisfies this property, you get this inequality here. So this is saying that, um, so Z2 should be interpreted as X. Okay, so the difference in norm between uh, vectors Z1 and Z2 is bounded by the diff, uh, distance of Z2 to SM sparse vectors. So this we expect to be small plus the uh, measurement error. And then this quantity here, which you'll hopefully, uh, if I've not been going too fast, recognize as the square root lasso objective function. So this is the objective function applied to Z1, and this is to Z2. And this is exactly the, the thing that we want in order to use uh, algorithm unrolling and restart the techniques uh, to develop something that converges exponential, uh, exponentially. Can I ask a okay, question so, over there? Yeah. So maybe I might misunderstood something, but if you change the role of Z1 and Z2 and add them together and divide by two, then you get the same right hand, left hand side, but the right your right hand side now become some of some of the too small part. So that, that, that that's that's a very good question, but I'm assuming that Z2. Uh, it, it, the, the, this 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 term here, according to Z two, is small. When I actually reconstruct the method, uh, when I when I try and reconstruct Z two, I know nothing about how Z, how Z one behaves in terms. Of, well, I, I can check how sparse it is, but I have no control of of whether this is small as it converges to to Z two, right? So, so you you want um, so when when you're looking at your model class of vectors you reconstruct, you don't want this assumption uh, on the on the output of your neural network as the algorithm proceeds, uh, you, you want it on the on the vector. I so see. hopefully that. Do you treat yeah. Z two being the actual solution and Z one is the output of? Yes. The okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. No. yeah. This this is confusing. I, I should have used X here and Z or something like that. But yeah. Ex yeah. Exactly thank right. You. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so this is a simplified version of the theorem. Um, so if, if you um, Okay, so, so, so we provide an algorithm that does the following. As input, you provide the sparsity parameters. So usually you can estimate these. Uh, weights, a matrix A, remember we only have inexact input, so that, that's captured as well. That satisfies the, uh, this robust null space property levels with uh, these constants here. Uh, positive n, uh, positive integer n and positive uh, constants delta b1 and b2. Uh, such that the algorithm outputs a neural network, phi n, with order n layers. I should say the width is of order capital N, so I'm not cheating by looking at a very wide neural network, uh, with the following property. If I take any x, so think of this as the guy I want to recover, any y, the, the samples I see, if the distance plus the uh, noise of the measurements is of order delta, so remember that we expect this to be small, and if X uh, is uh, bounded of order B1, Y bounded of order B2. So this just means I'm working on compact sets. The following stable and exponential convergence guarantee in N. Right, so as my number of layers increases, I get exponential convergence down to this delta. And this links to the previous question of, of this fundamental, uh, fundamental barrier as well. Okay, so some comments on this. So the architecture, uh, as has already been spotted, um, is, is inspired by 
restarted and reweighted and rolling of a primal dual algorithm for this objective function. Uh, it's, it's, it's quite subtle because if you just do naive and rolling, uh, the best you can prove is only slow uh, rates of algebraic convergence. So it's a bit fiddly. Um, as well as stability, um, the robust null space property allows the exponential convergence with this restarting. So you'll notice that as input, I provide the row and the gamma, and this is notoriously difficult to know a priori. If you don't know these, uh, then you can also increase the width of the neural network by a factor of log n, uh, and you can get rid of needing to know it. Um, and another thing we do, so we have stability here in this reconstruction guarantee, right? So this is a stable condition, but you also have stability and numerical stability in the neural network itself. So you can bound, uh, you can bound the error, assuming that you only approximately apply uh, the nonlinear maps, the activation functions at each step in your neural network. And you get stability even as n gets very, very, uh, very big. Okay, so uh, I'm going to move to examples in image recovery. Uh, I'm going to, for time reason, perhaps not, not spend too much on this theorem. Um, the take home message is that you can, uh, so, so, okay, so, so we consider subsampled uh, Fourier measurements, so discrete Fourier transform, and also Walsh measurements. So those are binary measurements, so the Hadamard matrix, zeros and ones. And I'm going to co uh, consider reconstruction of the Haar wave coefficients. So we expect those to be sparse or, or sparse in levels. So we design a, a quasi-optimal sampling strategy. Uh, so remember, these are the this a, a sparse levels so that you can prove that the matrix A satisfies uh, this property here that you need. And then the key point is for an accuracy delta, you only need log, a log delta to the minus one layers uh, to, achieve, to achieve that accuracy. Okay. so. These are the types of sampling patterns. Again, I'm not gonna go into too much detail, uh, but I'm gonna end with some, um, some sort of new, uh, interesting numerical examples that both demonstrate the theorem, the, the, the theory, and also um, point towards a, the very interesting question of stability and accuracy uh, and the potential trade-off between the two. Okay, so first, just a verification of, of, the, of, of the, um, the theorem, so these fire nets. So here I've taken an image uh, and I'm going to consider Fourier sampling and binary sampling. I'm going to add some noise in this, in this case, I think it's 2% and use 15% uh, uh, subsampling. This red box is the zoom in section here. So you can see it's pretty, pretty effective. Okay, captures the nice details. Uh, and then you might ask, okay, I have this N, right? So the N here corresponds to the number of hidden layers in my uh, neural network, uh, and also this delta. So this is the figure that I promised. Okay, so uh, let me explain what's going on here. So the, the red curve is the objective function. Okay, so how close we are to the minimum of the objective function. So remember, that's the square root lasso function. The blue curve shows how close we are um, to the image, in this case, uh, the wave of coefficients. And the um, dashed line is this, this fundamental barrier, this delta here. Okay, so you can see you get nice exponential convergence until you hit this uh, plateau. So this is Fourier, this is uh, binary. Uh, and this is really nice. So I haven't got a, a figure that shows this, but if you compare this to uh, standard iterative things like FISTER and stuff like that, uh, you, you need you know, hundreds, if not thousands of iterations to get a very good precision. Okay, so uh, this is on a very large image as well. Um, okay, so that's demonstration of convergence. Uh, let's also look at the stability uh, question. So if we go back uh, to near the beginning of the talk, do you remember I had this um, paper from, from Nature which claimed to have superior stability? Uh, and it turns out that th this particular neural network is, is, is very unstable. So at the top here, I've got... Um, an image of a brain from their data set, and I'm adding adversarial perturbations, and I'm looking at the difference in the output. Right, so you can see this severe instability. So I'm now going to do the same thing with uh, with our finites, the same image, and but the adversarial perturbations are now going to be computed for that new neural network, and I'm going to choose them so they're at least as big as the perturbations appear. So it's a fair test, and you see nice 
uh, nice stability, uh, which is good. And if you actually measure the the error of the output, it's proportional to the the perturbation, as uh, you expect from this theorem here, this delta. Okay. Uh, something really curious happens. So, so okay, we, we have a stable method and an unstable method. What happens if we combine them, right? So you might think, okay, automap might be super amazingly accurate on particular types of images, uh, but it might be very unstable. Can we somehow take advantage of that accuracy, but also add stability? So something we did was we took automap and then we concatenated it with our Firenet uh, and, and it works. So, so this is the output of automap. This is the output of the concatenated network. So you can see it's getting something nice. Uh, and you can actually run the stability test with a, a, applied to that concatenation again, and you can get uh, stability. So this, this is something interesting that- So Matthew, uh, what, what are you doing here? Are you sort of uh, interpolating norms? You can think of that as, oh, as doing an inter interpolating, minimizing interpolating norms, where people are doing interpolating norms, like not just one norm, but another sort of a combination of, well, by, by, uh, by, mean, adding, by adding those two, two together, Oh, I see. Um, so, so, so what we're doing is we're taking the output of Automap as an input to our neural network, uh, and also the uh, the original uh, measurements as well. So, okay. So, so you 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 now have you can think of it as sort of two two channels uh, fed into our neural network. Uh, so, if if one of these guys is very accurate, you'll get a very accurate reconstruction. So, for what, example, what's the, the loss function is what. The loss function so is still the lasso, the square root lasso. Exactly. So, some layers. Yeah. So, so you can look at when you when you unroll, you can also add an extra uh, input, which is your starting vector. So you can think of it as a warm start. Right? Okay. So, okay. Yeah. So this is your warm start. Right. Um, so so if if automap is very accurate, you're going to get a fantastic warm start, which means that you're going to need much fewer. Uh, layers potentially. Okay. Uh, okay. So uh, final final numerical example is this um, stability and accuracy trade off. Uh, so so this is perhaps an artificial example, but uh, but I think it it raises a very interesting philosophical question. Um, so here I'm going to look at uh, collections of images which just are formed of ellipses. So things like this. Uh, I'm also going to, so the neural networks, networks will be trained on images like this. I'm also going to add a small detail uh, in this blue frame here in the form of text. So you can think of this as looking at the generalization accuracy. Uh, and then I'm also going to run the stability test with different neural networks, and you'll see the different outputs in the middle here. Uh, so first of all, I'm going to take a, uh, just a standard unit. I'm not going to, not going to optimize it in any special way or anything like that. Uh, I'm, I'm going to see what happens. So if I do this, uh, I get instability, but I also get very good accuracy. And here I'm, I'm training on just the ellipses. So I'm not, um, not adding noise to my, um, my training uh, data or anything like that. So, so you might expect this instability. Okay, and then as the question said earlier, um, what happens if we add you know, noise or jittering or uh, enlarge our training data? Okay, so if we do this, we get this picture here. So I'm going to go backwards and forth a couple of times. You see that in the middle, you get uh, you get rid of this instability, which is uh, fantastic. But you also lose the accuracy on the right hand side. Okay, so you can imagine in this sort of this this, this trade off, you've traded uh, accuracy here, oops, um, for or stability here. Uh, so let's see what happens with Firenets, and it's somewhere in the middle. So you, so you get very nice uh, accuracy here. You get pretty good stability. It's not as stable as, as this one, but it's certainly more stable uh, than this one. This is just one example. We, we, we tested on lots of similar, similar examples as well. Um, so yeah, so, 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 so this, this is kind of uh, one, one of the questions that I want to end on is sort of how do you traverse this, this optimal trade-off, right? So it's in certain applications you could imagine you really, really care about stability, right? If it's a life and death uh, situation, whereas in other applications, you might not care about this particular behavior, but you really want to see the, 
the accuracy or the generalization accuracy. Okay, so I think that sort of wraps up uh, what I wanted to, to say. Uh, so to conclude, um, there's a need for foundations in AI and deep learning. So we're, we're really uh, at, at the start of you know, some really exciting uh, revolutions within, within science, I think. And mathematicians have a fantastic opportunity to develop these uh, foundations. So our results, uh, we constructed well-conditioned problems where uh, mappings from the training data to neural networks exists, uh, but you, you can never train your neural network. You have this um, this weird uh, weird case where uh, you pick a k, you could get k minus one digit. Uh, you couldn't get k minus one digits. Uh, you could get k minus you could get k minus one digits. Uh, sorry, I've misread that. So you can't get k digits. You can get k minus one digits, but it takes arbitrary many training data, uh, and you can you can get k minus two digits with only one uh, training data. Uh, and then I showed you that under specific conditions that actually arise in practice, there are algorithms, and you can prove there are algorithms, that compute uh, stable neural networks. So we had neural networks that we proved were uh, stable against adversarial attacks and also converged exponentially. But also, at the same time, there's this trade-off, right, uh, between stability and accuracy. So uh, really an open question is how do we ultimately traverse this, this trade-off Finance provide a balance, but of course are likely not the end of the story. Uh, so hopefully this has uh, inspired you a bit to think about foundations uh, in a high and deep learning. Great, thanks for thanks for listening. Thank you, Matthew. I have a question. It just popped in my mind. Is uh, when we do guns, right, and we have different uh, was distances, and we put penalty terms, and we, uh, uh, we can even do optimum transport and all that stuff. Yeah. We, we're trying to stabilize the network while we're keeping the accuracy, right? Mm -hmm. how, how do you analyze how do you analyze guns with all these uh, whistles and bells? Because the the distance is different, and then the stabilizations with the penalty and all uh, gradient penalty is different. See, so you you can actually um, it's an interesting question. You can actually prove similar results to this even with things like guns and stuff like that, uh, and it's all it's all connected with the assumptions on uh where is it on your matrix a uh, so you can prove that so this is property um kernel aware which essentially means that if you have two vectors that are uh, close to the kernel of a and your reconstruction recovers those very accurately then you can prove that no matter what you do even if you train it with with gans you can actually look at the solution that gans will produce uh, you still get uh, instability. So to be honest, I, I don't really have an answer as to where those methods sit along this, this trade-off curve uh, because it's, it's super subtle to, to, to prove whether you, you get a, a stable reconstruction. Well, um, I'm, I'm talking about the, uh, the, with the, with the penalty, the, 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 yeah. the gradient, yeah, the gradient penalty, uh, GP, w, WGP, what was the thing, GP, uh, gradient penalty gun? So that, that seems to be very stable and kind of accurate. And then we, we create a version where we had also optimum transport uh, in being involved. And then, so, so yeah. we're, so, 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 we, we didn't so think we, about we, this type of, but, but that's what we're after actually, yeah. You, you, you can, uh, we, we have some uh, numerical examples, um, which are similar to this, but for different things like GANs as well. Uh, and in certain cases you, you, can, you can write down um, uh, if you could solve, for example, the, the optimization problem to train your neural network with, 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 with GANs, you can, you can write down, uh, in some cases, the solution. You can, see, you can see this type of effect. So, of course, you know, it, it depends on what type of images you want to recover. You might not care about things like uh, uh, writing or, or, or small, small details. The, the other thing I noticed is that fire nets sacrifices the edges, or is it just this example? Um, you see? Yes, I, I do see. Um, All the noise sits on the, on the edges. Not I, the hadn't edges. Really, I, have, I haven't really tested that on other examples. So, so certainly for the ellipses, uh, for this, the noise this type from, of the, image, <laughs> from the balcony and put on the edges. <laughs> if you yeah. play back and, back, back and forth, you will see. <laughs> yeah, exactly. 
So certainly for, for different types of ellipse images, you, you get the same thing. Sorry? No, no, it's fine. Okay, yeah. So, so certainly for, for the ellipses and these types of um, uh, these images, you, you get this effect. I don't know what happens, for example, with more complicated things uh, like this. Um, yeah, I don't really have an answer, actually, why, why that happens. It's a, it's a good, good spot. Um, Can I ask a couple of questions? Yes, yes, uh, Yang Chu. Yeah. Um, so this is only for the L1 minimization problem you set up in the earlier. Is that correct? For the reject uh, yeah. and the theoretical. OK. Then one other question is, um, the other question, uh, could you go back to your last slide, the conclusion part? Yeah. yeah. So here I noticed that the problem is actually depending on K, so that for, like, for so the problem depending on K, so that I'm wondering, uh, might be the existence might return you a trivial problem, like uh -huh. a really trivial problem, so that like for any K, the it all satisfies. So I'm wondering if your proof or uh, would somehow prevent those the trivialness of yeah. the problem. Yeah, so, so yes, it, it, it does. So for example, um, where is it? This numerical example as well. But but actually, um, you can see this effect for very, this is where I really should have included the MATLAB example to, 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 to give you a flavor of exactly what you're saying. You can see it with, with basic um, building functions in, in, in MATLAB, for example, like lasso and stuff like that. Mm. Uh, th this sort of flipping effect. And going back to your point about K, uh, it, 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 that's, that's a very good point. That sort of, okay, in some applications, mm. uh, K could be large enough, right? You don't care if you get K minus two rather than K. Um, but actually, um, for a lot of these problems, for example, uh, going back to this slide here, mm. K is related to this delta. So it also depends on, on the noise uh, that you have in your model as well. So yes, it, it could be the case that um, it doesn't matter in practice, but in yeah, some yeah, cases yeah. it does. And, and that's really sort of one of the questions that I think Foundations is really useful for is, is sort of figuring out, uh, so this, this would go back to, um, what is it? Too many slides. Uh, this slide here, boundaries of methodologies, right? Are, are there, are there certain cases where it works and certain cases where mm. uh, it doesn't? Um, and it's, it's yeah, pretty open at the moment. Yeah, I'm glad to see you did some experiment to those the MATLAB experiment, but that I think the theorem would be much more powerful, sounds like more powerful such that like providing conditions under which type of class of problems, there exists some limit of the K satisfying certain condition might sound much more stronger. Although this yeah. is also a very good result and the uh, experiment. And also, um, maybe this might be a philosophical question. I think uh, there is a, have you heard about some implicit layer of the neural network? So, um, I, so, so I will just uh, copy and paste on through the chat. So there is a group okay, of yeah. people, they, they trying to propose some implicit layers so that uh, normally what I would think of neural network is just a feed for the neural network or residual network and uh, some yeah. recurrent neural network. But what they have proposed is that neural network can have an implicit layer. So basically saying that your first layer can be L1 minimization solver so that your input is just A and X or A and the right hand side and output is X. Mm -hmm. So if that is the case, it sounds like to me that the, the, there exists a neural network can find a sparse minimization solution equally well as the state of the art algorithm. So maybe you may just have a look on this. This is not just a uh, question, just a comment on it. Yeah, no, so, th thank you. That, that's yeah, that, that's great to a, see that. Just to have a look and, and maybe it might be worth yeah. defining what you mean by neural network. So because of the, there is a, some notion that they try uh, to implement yeah. the implicit layer. So I think the implicit layer is a lot, I think, um, 
it's 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 it's, it's like apple and oranges because there is an algorithm we can do solve the problem but if you treat those entire the, the, the algorithm one, as a layer then one thing i would say though is that um so you have this impossibility result on on computing the l1 minimizer so in certain cases you could you could show that there is you 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 can't construct such a such an implicit layer oh, right, 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 right 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 because the fundamental limit of l1 minimization problem right right exactly yeah. Yeah, yeah yeah um so it might be the case that there are conditions on a that allow you to for example use fire nets as that implicit layer or some other method uh, but in some other cases you don't um right yeah. got it got it yeah that's all i have thank you so much thanks all right so is there any other questions for dr kobrook well um if not uh please join me and then welcome uh, and thank our speaker again uh that's a very excellent talk so um that's the end of this week's uh, seminar. So everybody have a great weekend. So I will upload this um, recording to our Dropbox uh, and I will share this to everyone. So everybody have a good weekend. All right, see you next time. Thank you. Thank you.